Good evening everybody and welcome to the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation. My name is Jason James, um, I'm Director General of the Foundation and I'm also going to be chairing um, tonight's session which uh, will be a little unusual, I think it'll be a bit more free form uh, than we usually have but uh, hopefully it will develop into a very interesting discussion between our, our two speakers and you, the audience. And it's very nice also to welcome a large number of people from Listen Gallery um, this evening. Um, and the reason for that is that our first speaker, Professor Miyajima, uh, has a show opening at Listen Gallery in just a, a week or so. So let me um, start by introducing Professor Miyajima and then uh, I think you're going to speak for about five or so minutes and, and show some of your artworks and then uh, I'll introduce our second speaker, Professor Zeki. <coughs> so um, Professor Miyajima is an artist uh, and he's also uh, the vice president of two universities of art and design in Japan, uh, Tohoku University of Art and Design and Kyoto University of Art and Design. And if you know the geography of Japan, you'll recognize that must be a bit of a logistical challenge. One's up in the north and the other one's uh, further down south. Um, he took part in the 43rd Venice Biennale in 1988 uh, and since then uh, has been very active uh, internationally. Um, I'll leave it to him really to speak uh, about his art, but he has artworks as a, uh, in the permanent collections of a number of uh, major institutions, including the Tate, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, uh, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo, uh, among others. And uh, we first came across him, it wasn't actually me, my colleague Shihoko in the front row there, uh, first came across him when he designed the uh, stage uh, decor for uh, Wayne McGregor's ballet, uh, Limen, or we're not quite sure whether to pronounce it Limen or Limen, but uh, that was in 2009 at the Covent Garden. Um, so I'll pass straight over to you, Professor Media, to uh, start talking. Okay. Thank you for coming, and uh, I'm very honored to be here. And uh, thank you for coming, Professor Deki, and uh, I'm very happy with him. So, first of all, uh, I show in the, my artwork, new artwork, uh, at the Listen Gallery, uh, the opening next uh, Friday. And uh, this is a, this is a one element of the LED, new LEDs. <coughs> and uh, this is a one element which is uh, made by uh, LED, light emitting diode, and uh, some steel basement with uh, plastic case and uh, electric wire. So it it like a cradle to life and connecting to the others. My LEDs uh, has evolved a bit. Of course, I keep my concept and uh, uh, counting system. Before, I control uh, every LED uh, uh, from me, counting speed. Uh, and uh, however, <coughs> on this series, it's a new series, counting speed is no control from me. This is a different point. So new LED system has set up on counting speed itself by attended movement around the other LEDs. Uh, calculated microcomputer it has and uh, uh, totally randomly uh, like the natural faces. This program by Dr. Ikegami, who is a scientist of uh, artificial life and engineering uh, complex system. This big, ch uh, big change caused I had a terrible experience of uh, earthquake in Japan, 2011. Until then, we Japanese misunderstood that we can control everything, even the nature. However, and that earthquake was clear that nature never controls from anything. 
my fundamental concept of my work is the spark of life. So after that, I have to make a work close to nature. This is an installation view. <coughs> this, uh, this time I use new type of LED called eye model to create some kind of the work. One is, this is the title of a life to collapse some organism. This is a French word. The concept from a uh, uh, French philosopher, Gilles Duroux. This LED has a relationship with the other LEDs and it determines counting speed from itself. And uh, other works. So I show you the, some video. You can see freaking light. It means counting numbers from nine to one, or from one to nine. And black part means zero. On my work. So just a blackout means zero, it means ze uh, this. Each LED shows a different counting speed. But this time, you can see one LED has a different speed, change the speed, fast or slow. This is a gigami program. Counting speed influences the other. So just the blackout, it means uh, zero. <coughs> yes. Second one is a light palace, tea room. This is a, a room for the drinking art or drinking time, not Japanese tea. To see it, only one person to go in. This is a very, uh, very rich space for the one person. <coughs> i show you some video. In this room, our audience uh, take off shoes and open the door can go in. It's very quiet, quiet space. <coughs> so sitting the lady is my, my wife. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. So it's uh, only one person to the completely medita meditation room. Its room has a uh, uh, hundred eighty uh, numbers surrounding the room. <coughs> it's just a universe. I decide only one person comes in because uh, if some couple comes in the, this room, it's very quiet, very romantic. <laughs> Too much love, you know, so it's very dangerous. <laughs> okay, so I finished uh, my introduction. So the next week I have a show in the Listen Gallery, so you can see the real work and uh, Tea House too, you know. So please come in the uh, Listen Gallery. Okay, thank you.
Right, thank you very much, Miyajima Sensei. And I'd just like to introduce our second speaker, um, Professor Semir Zeki. And Professor Zeki is Professor of Neuroaesthetics uh, at University College London. Uh, he became a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1990, Fellow of the Academia Europea in 1993, and of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts in 1995, and was awarded the Erasmus Medal uh, in 2008. And he is the convener of the annual uh, international meeting which takes place in the neuroaesthetics field. Um, and his research focuses on how the visual brain is organized. He's written uh, a number of books, um, but they're all looking at uh, vision, art, and the brain. So if I can just hand over to you to say a few words of context, and then we'll develop the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Tetsuo. It's <laughs> very nice to have you in Thank London you. last time we were in Sendai. I'm, um, I've spent uh, a lot of my life uh, studying the brain and how uh, the brain is organized for us to be able to see the world and see its different attributes, such as color and motion and form and uh, faces and, and so on. And um, more recently, I have taken seriously the professed aim, uh, or one of the professed aims of neurobiology. <coughs> Sorry, can you all hear me at the back? Uh, okay. uh, I'll turn, turn it off, and if not, you might have to here. I saw some vacuous looks in the <laughs> table. I just going up. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to stand up? I'm just going to try now. I've just turned the can, you, can you hear me better now? Yeah. What a pity. <laughs> <laughs> this is a microphone. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I was saying that I spend much of my working life studying experimentally, let's say using electrophysiology and anatomy and various other sophisticated techniques like that to learn about how our brains are organized to allow us to see the world and its different attributes. In the past 10 years, I have taken more seriously one of the professed aims of neurobiology, which is to better understand those characteristics uh, that give us, <coughs> that make us, make us especially human. And among those, of course, there is language, but there's also uh, the capacity to experience beauty and desire and love, but also to experience hate, uh, sentiments in the service of which humans have destroyed so much, but also have built so much. So many people today, they are diminishing in number, I'm happy to say. Many people today would say that approaching these problems of beauty and desire and love is really going into soft science. Hard science can, uh, is, is looking at the properties of single cells, the molecular biology of uh, single cells, and so on. Well, I can tell you as a person who spent the better part of my uh, uh, working life doing what they call hard science, that in fact that is soft science, and this is hard science. Yeah. To understand the experience of beauty and the desire of love is really hard. To understand the connection between two areas of the brain is actually relatively simple. <clears throat> so let me talk about beauty. Now, uh, the question that neurobiology addresses is not what is beauty. We have no means of answering a question like that. Instead, we ask the question in a much more restricted way. We say, what are the neural implications what are the neural mechanisms that allow humans to experience beauty? So it's a very specific question. Now, the nature of beauty has been debated for 2,500 years, ever since the time of Plato, without adequate resolution. Is there, <coughs> excuse me, is there a single characteristic or a single set of characteristics that defines beauty? Uh, and if so, what are they? There has been no resolution because uh, the properties put forward have not been found to be universally valid. Symmetry, proportion, harmony are important in architecture and have been emphasized by Bernardo and by Alberti uh, and by others. But if you look at Japanese culture, uh, symmetry is not a characteristic of beauty. It's asymmetry that's a characteristic of beauty. Uh, the, 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 finished, the finished was considered to be very important 
uh, at the time of the when the French Academy was very influential in the 19th century. But for for the the for Japanese culture, the unstated uh, and the unfinished uh, has got uh, greater beauty. There is in the Japanese culture, I think, something like the the, the beauty of imperfection. So. Let us ask the question in a different way. Say, is there a single characteristic to beauty uh, to the, in terms of brain organization, one which applies to all races and uh, all cultures? And the answer is yes. <clears throat> Whenever people of any race or of any kind of knowledge uh, experience beauty, different people of course experience beauty in different things, but whenever people experience beauty, there is activity in a, in, a, in, in a part of the emotional brain known as the media orbital frontal cortex. This is a universal characteristic that we share uh, in common, the humankind shares this. And what's even more interesting is that this area is also active not only with the experience of, of uh, visual beauty and uh, auditory beauty, but also with mathematical beauty, uh, so that you have here, unlike the experience of visual and, and um, musical beauty, which is accessible to all of us, the experience of mathematical beauty is very restricted, it's accessible only to people with profound knowledge of mathematics, and yet mathematics also arouses strong emotions, aesthetic emotions, when properly, uh, when mathematical formulae are properly <coughs> solved, and that seems to correlate with activity in the same part uh, of the brain. Now, the study of mathematics introduces something very interesting, with which I think we can uh, start our dialogue with Tetsuo, which is that <coughs> if you look at mathematicians and look at the, uh, when they're experiencing equations that are beautiful and ugly and indifferent, you'll find that not all the mathematical formulae that they understand perfectly are considered beautiful. <coughs> so there is a separation between understanding and beauty. And this introduces a very interesting uh, topic which we, I think we should uh, uh, explore. Because in Tatsuo's work, uh, there are two different aspects for me as a neurobiologist. There is first of all the immediate impact, which is accessible to all of us. It goes that it's dazzling. Uh, there are various things about it which I could say. I could say, uh, for example, these flickering lights uh, showed us which parts of the brain they stimulate. I could uh, show you which parts of the brain are stimulated when there's simulated movement in your work. I can show you which parts of the brain are stimulated when you use different colors, which cycle in different uh, ways. I can do all of that. But there's another thing which is not accessible to all of us. Uh, I may know a bit, but not much more about it than the common uh, person in, in England. And I think that there are many Japanese people as well who would not find it very easy. Namely, the strong Buddhist influence, the strong Japanese influence of the, uh, as I was saying, the wabi-sabi, the, the ephemeral nature of the existence. I think the whole of Oriental culture for me can be summarized in a single and beautiful sentence, which is, nothing is permanent except change. Now, that is not something that the person who goes into a gallery uh, to look at your work necessarily knows. So, in a sense, I think I'd like really very much to begin, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, to begin by asking you, how do you separate these two concepts in your, in your uh, brain? I mean, you're working in a visual medium, which has to be attractive. But uh, you couldn't pull it off without these deep uh, and, and ancient concepts. Yeah. It's a very interesting question. And uh, so many people ask them. Uh, so, and I think uh, the beauty is uh, very important for me, and more than concept. But the concept is uh, very important for me for the creator, because the concept is something, the motivation to make something. The beauty is uh, presenting to understanding for the audience. Audience not necessary to understand my concept, just catch up, feel up some beauty. It's the first stage, but uh, if 
if the people catch up some beauty and the interesting the artwork, so people come in more deeply sight, so understanding more concept something, you know. So what they want know about the behind meaning. You, you think they would appreciate it more if they knew the concept? Yes. So the start is a beauty and catch up something interesting, you mm. know, mm. accessible. But uh, uh, the concept is kind of the deeply layer, you know. Yes. I want to uh, recount a story which uh, your work brings to my mind. Mm -hmm. As, uh, this is a true story of, uh, uh, the, uh, of a great mathematician by the name of Hermann Weyl, who uh, said, and I quote, he said, in my work I always try to combine truth with beauty, but when I have to choose between the two, I always choose beauty. Mm. And mm -hmm. the, the interesting part of the story is that he worked on, uh, on trying to reconcile mathematically the electromagnetism of James Clerk Maxwell with, the, uh, with Einstein's theory of relativity. So he came up with a formula after many years of work, which he thought was very beautiful. And so they sent, uh, he sent it to the journal to be published, and they refused it, because Einstein reviewed it, and he said, this is, you can't publish this, this is against all the known facts. And he said, well, it may be against all the known facts, but it is very beautiful, so you must publish it. Mm. So they did publish it, and 10 years after the publication of this paper, with the advent of uh, quantum mechanics, his formulations were found to be completely true. Mm. Right? So in a sense, what, what is quite interesting uh, from, from uh, the neuroaesthetic point of view is um, there must be some fundamental principles even of mathematics that are sifted out and experienced as beautiful because they are part of our biological constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in your, when I see your work, um, there are certain things which are really appealing. And if I were to put, um, I think, a hundred people in the room, I think we would have fair agreement mm -hmm. that these are appealing. But this is entirely based upon our biological constitution. So, you know, for example, you emphasize movement in some of your things. Now, movement happens to be an extremely important uh, 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 kind of signal for us as a protection. If you look at what kind of movement excites the brain best, mm -hmm. you find out very particular patterns of movement. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, you have tapped on these without even perhaps knowing. So that's why I say that, that the that the artist is a neurobiologist without even knowing it. Yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting. And uh, so I have a question. The, uh, you have uh, 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 some kind of a study about uh, kinetic art. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what's, uh, what's influenced the movement for the brain? So and uh, beauty. So how relate with the movement? The, the, that study we undertook because people never cease to tell us. You see, basically you have to understand that we are basically uh, the hoi polloi. We are looked down upon mm -hmm. as, as, as uh, ignorant people. So people always uh, tell us, what about the influence of culture, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. What about the influence of culture and knowledge? And so we say, well, look, this is very important. Of course, it is very important in the appreciation of art. But there's something beyond that, which is biological, which is common to all of humans, irrespective of their culture. So what we did is to get the computer to generate dots, all right, and move them in different patterns. Mm -hmm. We had about 20 different patterns. And we got subjects of all races and of all cultures to look at them. And it turned out, I was slightly surprised by it, that they all preferred a given pattern, mm -hmm. which actually consisted of all the dots being sort of grouped together and moving, like a flock of birds. Yeah. Uh, and it is this that led to 
strongest activity in the motion sensitive areas, but also led to activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex, activity of which uh, correlates now, correlates with the experience of beauty. Now, of course, there is an infinite number of movements you can, one can create. And uh, you, you, you uh, obviously create some which are very attractive, but you don't do it by a computer, presumably. Yeah. So uh, this brings me again to the point that I was, I was raising before the 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 the, 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 the humiliation mm -hmm. that we get of uh, don't you know that culture is important in, in art? Uh, I say well, I, I point to Tetsuo Miyajima. Yeah. But his work is not appreciated because of culture. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, a, it is a, the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. It's the extra. When the people here will go to listen gallery next week, uh, probably many of them don't know about the wabi sabi. They don't know about the fact that zero means death. Yes. Because they do not know the concept of the of the of the continuity mm -hmm. in 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 Japanese in in Buddhist culture. Mm -hmm. None of these things are relevant. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, it seems to me that your work is a perfect recipe for neuroaesthetics because there's these two uh, separate elements. But we'd like to, I'd like later on to come back to the concept. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, <coughs> and uh, the next, uh, I have a next question. Uh, everyone say that uh, Contemporary art is very difficult, you know. So I don't know the meaning behind the for the brain and the beauty. The understanding is important for that. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I think I think. Look, let's put it slightly differently. I think I'm being flippant. I think the understanding is important but it is a biological understanding. Mm -hmm. It does not depend upon culture. You know, um, Wittgenstein, I, I think actually Aristotle said it before in the, in, the, in the poetics, that you can gain a lot of knowledge through emotion, right? But it's knowledge that's not easily accessible to the linguistic system. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, that any of this uh, knowledge is, is important for appreciating your work of art. Mm -hmm. It may enhance it, but I don't think it's important. Now, um, you see, this this was really brought. Uh, let me let me give you uh, three people, three people from my culture, who uh, have strongly argued this case before me. One was Clive Bell. Mm -hmm. Clive Bell, an, uh, an English uh, art critic, the husband of Vanessa Bell who many of you may have heard of him. He uh, said that the last person, the last person to be able to appreciate a work of art, to feel the aesthetic emotion of a work of art, is the art historian, mm. because he knows too much. <laughs> that you have to approach a work of art without all this knowledge, without all these associations, to see the primitive, that which remains once you've removed everything away. Yeah. That would Clive Bell. The other person who insisted on that, a rather more recent person, it was Francis Bacon. Mm -hmm. Francis Bacon said, uh, I want to give a shock to the nervous system, to assault the nervous system before things get spelled out in the brain. It's a very interesting choice of words. Now, um, what did he do? He deformed figures. Yeah. And it, you see, whenever there is no way, there is no way in which you are going to ever adapt to a deformed figure. Mm. It's not going to happen, because looking at a deformed face actually activates the brain in a different way than looking at a normal face. So this is a biological knowledge of how eyes and things should be should be uh, uh, eyes should be organized relative to the nose and, and the mouth. The third person who said this is Marcel Proust. Mm. In his book, uh, Contra saint Berth, he said, every day I attach less importance to intelligence because every day I understand that it is outside it that we can regain something of our past impressions, which is the only material for art. Mm. So all these three people really would, uh, being uh, from the artistic humanistic side, would defend the notion that the artistic creation 
first and above all, must be independent of knowledge and culture uh, if, it is, if it is to have universal appeal. Now let me go to, to contemporary art. I would like very much to hear your views about it. I was, went to an art gallery in Cologne not long ago, and before me was a filing cabinet. Now, this was not a filing cabinet that could have been of Bismarck uh, or of uh, Count Metternich or something interesting like that. It was a filing cabinet which would, you could have purchased from um, uh, IKEA. Mm. And I was really asked to contemplate this filing cabinet and learn something about it. It is really entirely uninteresting, very, very uninteresting. Uh, and I think that, that a lot of uh, modern uh, contemporary art is searching for uh, for a novelty. And the search for novelty in itself is not that interesting, uh, unless it's in a context. I, I, I don't know what you make of it. You know what happened at the Tate Gallery long, not long ago? <laughs> it was a very interesting thing. There was a, 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 uh, some, an installation yes. by an artist in which it was a rubbish bin. Yeah. And uh, after a few days, this, the cleaner emptied the rubbish bin, not realizing it was part of the installation. <laughs> so so I, I would like to hear, what, uh, you see, when you go to conceptual art and you depart too much from the biological constitution mm -hmm. that finds something beautiful and yeah. that communicates to the beauty of the face, the beauty of the body, the beauty of Mont Blanc, the beauty of, of Mount Fuji, then you are going into inside entirely the conceptual world, and you are leaving really the world of beauty and thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So I, I completely agree with the, uh, with the Deki, and uh, so I like uh, conceptual art very much. Oh. But uh, so very good quality conceptual art. So they have a. Uh, so deeply concept behind, but at the same time, they have a beauty itself. Mm. So, for example, on Kawara, or painting, date painting, so his concept is very strong, very strike, but the object and the tableau is so deeply beauty, you know. So it's very strike, very uh, involved. Well, yeah. which, which brings me back to the question I, 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 I'm not sure I understood well, but I'd like to go back to it. You have a concept, a concept that's very broad, uh, a concept that's deeply religious, yep. a concept that is uh, involves fundamental, fundamental aspects of human existence, mm -hmm. of the cycle of life and of death. Uh, how do you, in your mind, translate that into something which is visually stunning and beautiful. This is what, uh, I just want to give you an example of what I'm trying to say. You see, Cezanne, <coughs> Cezanne had a concept of what a form was and how it could be modulated by color. Right? So he painted Montaigne Saint Victoire about 80 times. And in the process went from very naturalistic images to very abstract images. So, so but there was a single concept, which was the representation of form and its modulation by color. Now, I would like to ask you, how do you go about translating these concepts into these different images? Yeah. So, for me, if the figurative artist can be easy to reach to get uh, images of the surface, you know, because, uh, for example, I, I making, uh, uh, I making a paint as uh, this, uh, this grass. So this grass is a purpose. So reach this, you know. This is a finishing, you know, and I take, so the process to close to this grass. Okay, so this is uh, easy because the uh, purpose here, but the uh, abstract conceptual things is very 
uh, invisible images of that. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to reach there. So it's, it's, I don't know, so it's very fragile and uh, uh, so I think the concept is something, the purpose for artists, you know. I reach their process to cross to the, this purpose, you know. So if the concept is very strong, so it's very images, you know, it's, uh, it's very concrete things and uh, but you say, so, so you're implying you're implying that the concept is very strong. What you said for the artist. Yes. So, in your view, it's not very important for me. Yes, of course. It's not very important yeah. for me. For example, uh, you know the concept. Uh, as I say, concept is uh, uh, very important things for the artist motivation mm. to create something. Mm. If if not, it's nothing to do. Hmm. Well, uh, you know, it's quite interesting <laughs> you say for the artist. Uh, yeah. There is a story of uh, T.S. Eliot, who was a the, the, uh, great uh, English mm -hmm. poet. Uh, one day somebody uh, said to, you know, these lines, uh, this is how uh, I interpret them. And T.S. Eliot uh, said, oh, thank you very much, I, I now understand them. <laughs> he, had, he, had, he, had, he had didn't know. Let me go on to, 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 to uh, an, another issue which is of deep uh, interest to me, which is the issue of um, uh, imperfection. Imperfection, now this is a, a deeply rooted attribute of your culture. Um, I don't know whether it is unique to Japan or whether it is part of, of the uh, uh, Chinese culture as well. But where do I look for imperfection in your works? This is a nasty question. <laughs> where? 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 I mean, here I am sitting in yeah. front of the most uh, culturally bound artist in our time. There is no greater culturally bound artist than you, you either in the East or in the West. So one of the aspects of your culture, which is a very prized aspect of your culture, is the beauty of imperfection. Mm. So where is it? What do you mean? Or do you even, even, as I say, I don't know. Concept. <coughs> hmm? Concept. Mm. Concept. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the translate the, the Transcend uh, something, but uh, it's uh, uh, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but do, do you yeah. think? Do you think you've got? Do you think this is in your mind uh, as a concept when you create works to have them to have certain imperfection there? Short circuit. Is um, leave you to think about that. Yes, a bit. I'm thinking because we've got an awful lot of uh, people who know about art in the audience. Mm -hmm. um, Good. So I mean, I, I have a lot of questions in my mind too, but I'm not really an art specialist, and I think probably the ones from the audience would be more interesting. So, may I just just one important point, which, which I'd very much like to. Uh, you, you you have said uh, that, that that for you, art is a means of delivering message to people. Yes. Okay. So what is the message that you are delivering? My message? Yes. Your main message? Yes. Because there are many neurobiological messages, but, but your main message? Yeah, so my message is uh, mainly message is uh, life. Life is important and uh, life is a very, uh, very beautiful thing, you know, so, and uh, take care of the life. And uh, so it's 
active to the to the life. So because uh, my gadget LED is symbolizing of life, and almost the uh, title with uh, my artwork is the life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much.